With the UK and the EU reportedly having agreed an outline financial settlement to begin the long haul towards a trade deal, does this bring Brexit any closer? We're joined now by Simon French, Chief Economist with Panmure Gordon. Simon, welcome. Thank you. Um, does this uh, outline deal that we've heard nothing about in terms of number itself fill you with any hope? Look, it's uh, helpful that the two sides are starting to hone in on a number. There are some suggestions of between about 40 and 60 billion euros, which, to be honest, was the kind of number that had been banded around some months ago and the government seems to have dismissed. The fact that they're technocrats on itemising the bill seem to have converged on a figure, it takes us one third potentially of the way there. The other third, or the other two thirds, the first one being the right to remain of EU nationals, I don't think that's a huge problem, but there is this thing looming in the background which is the Northern Ireland border and I still think that's a huge sticking point, so it doesn't actually bring Brexit any closer in my view. Yeah, uh, I want to pick up actually on the points you mentioned about numbers. The FT reporting today that the UK has accepted total liabilities of around 100 billion uh, euros Mm. which would net down to around about the 40, 40, 45, 50 yeah. uh, billion. Um, what do the economics look like around these sort of numbers? I mean, there mm. comes a point, presumably, where if we, as the UK, end up paying too much, it doesn't matter what trade deal we end up getting, it's going to cost us a tonne. Yep. Can we afford it? We can afford it, but it's whether it's value for money. Um, what you're looking at is the liabilities that the UK would have paid in any case up to the end of the 2020 uh, round, which is where the budget is settled on at the EU level. But what is being haggled over is whether the UK has liabilities on longer term infrastructure and development projects for the enlarged EU and that is much more of a moot point whether we get value from that in terms of the relationships going forward crucially hinges on the nature of the trade deal that we'll have with the EU27 because of course leveraging economic growth from the expanded EU will determine how frictionless trade is going forward. If we do end up meeting this bill of 40, 45, 50 billion euros mm -hmm. how important is that for the EU budget going forward? Well, it's very important through to 2020 because it stops other net contributors, of which there are only two, actually putting more money into the pot to cover the shortfall. But it only defers the day of reckoning for the European Union. They will have to, when they start to discuss the 2020 to 2027 budget, rely probably on the UK not contributing much. I mean, there is a scenario where a bit like the Swiss and the Norwegian economies, we still to contribute some, but it's unlikely to be of the 9 billion, 10 billion level that the UK currently contributes. So it, it defers that day of reckoning, but it, co it solves a short-term problem. Going, going back to what we're going to be paying for out of this deal, mm. the UK owns real estate, it owns a part of real estate, it owns part of the structure of the EU, that's got to be worth something to put onto the onto the profit and loss account, isn't it? That's right, and uh, some Brexiteers will argue that actually we're just looking at the liability side of this and not the asset side, and when you start to net off, it looks very, very different. But let's not pretend that this is an economic assessment. This is a political judgment. This is a political judgment on the uh, side of the EU27 on the basis of what message they can send to their own electorates, which of course they're talking to throughout this process, on the, the impact of leaving the European Union and what that means fiscally and what disincentives there may be to other uh, separatist groups going forward. Uh, your clients at uh, Pamir Gordon, are you still cautioning about a potential no deal? Cliff edge, uh, we, whatever it might be. We are, but from the political process in the UK being very, very fractious still. And I think that's an important point to make as we run into March 2019 and the potential cliff edge is whatever deal Theresa May and her government come back to the House of Commons with, and indeed the House of Lords, will they accept this or will they vote it down? And if they vote it down because it's unacceptable potentially to one side for being not soft enough, but from another side being uh, not hard enough, then you've got a quorum of politicians rejecting the deal and that is a potential hard Brexit onto WTO terms. We are cautioning our clients that that is a very real prospect, around 30 to 35 percent likelihood. Um, WTO terms, Robert Alds was sitting in the chair, you were, talk you were sitting in there, he's a mm. director at the Bruges Group. He was talking as well, uh, there are other potential deals to work under, United Nations Economic Commission, uh, the World Customs Organization, there are other um, agreements that we could fall back on, not just WTO. WTO, which has come in for some bashing recently mm -hmm. because of the high tariffs that are built yep. into that deal. 
Uh, look, I don't think that the WTO terms, the tariffs, which average about 4%, are a particular problem for UK businesses going forward. And actually, most of our clients we're speaking to do not worry about a, an average 4% tariff because they've just had, in part, a 15% improvement in the terms of trade from the devaluation of sterling, making exports more competitive. But what is crucial, and this is where any other bilateral supranational arrangement doesn't really necessarily help is the non-tariff barriers. This is around standards, around regulation. We're an 80% services economy in the UK where tariffs are irrelevant. What matters is the ability to trade and recognise people's standards, regulation across as large an addressable market as possible. Now clearly 500 million people, a very addressable, very proximate market and those frictions would want to be reduced post-Brexit in order to facilitate the economic advantage. Jacob rees -Mogg is talking about potential of 135 billion uh, sterling worth of savings over five years. Um, if we had a no deal, he was talking about that, but he's also saying the reason why is because we would have um, low uh, regulation, we would have low corporate taxation to bring business in, we would be lessening the friction um, mm -hmm. caused by red tape and so forth. Mm -hmm. His argument is that being outside the EU, even if it is a cliff edge, would ultimately be a really good deal for us. Uh, two problems to that. First of all, a race to the bottom on regulation. It's not clear that the UK electorate voted for that. And is that the type of economy that uh, the UK uh, electorate will accept going forward? I think there's a big question mark over that. Uh, the second one is actually on an international basis, the UK in terms of its labour market and its product market standards is already very, very deregulated. Uh, the problem often is of the making of our own parliamentarians, of which Jacob Rees-Mogg is one of them. Um, I'll give you just a date, one data point. The UK's tax code is the second longest in the world at 18,000 pages long. The German tax code is one of the most competitive at just 1,900 pages long, so almost a tenth of the size. They're both in the European Union. So clearly, being a member of the European Union is not a constraint on simplification and reducing red tape. So to, to create that as a straw man gets easily knocked down. OK. Um, let's just quickly talk about, as well, uh, the effect on all this on all the markets. If we do get mm. this situation where we do ever ultimately to uh, rely on WTO rules or the cliff edge, the hard Brexit, whatever, mm. um, what is what is the market going to make of that on both sides of the channel? Right, so starting at home here in the UK, I think you see a material weakness again in sterling as that is one of the uh, measures through which international investors have gone risk off on UK assets and will continue to do so if they have the uncertainty of a cliff edge. Nobody can know for certain what it will look like, but the pure uncertainty as we head into Q1 2019 will mean that sterling will depreciate. But of course, UK listed assets with big US, so Euro, Yen, revenue news will of course outperform in that environment and we've seen that certainly over the last uh, 12 months as sterling has been weak. Um, overseas I think you and looking into the eurozone I mean the momentum in that economy is very impressive at the moment it's very very difficult to see that derailed by a no deal scenario but there will be sectors heavily reliant on the UK consumer that will be under pressure the issue is that uh, I think a lot of Brexiteers relied on that as a lobbying power into the EU, and that's just not coming to the fore in discussions thus far. The point about sectors, mm. what sectors should we be looking at particularly? Those that might win and those that might lose on a hard deal? Yeah, on a hard deal, I think you start to look at uh, three sectors in the UK, uh, construction, financial services and technology. For those, those are very reliant on a, um, a soft border relationship, free movement of workers being integral to that, being able to source labour from around the world. A hard Brexit facilitates the government to tighten eligibility to the UK labour market and with supplies of skills in, in short supply you're going to see the cost base in those industries start to rise. In terms of the gainers I mean the manufacturing sector has done very very well it's only 15% of the economy but that in terms the in the UK the manufacturing sector has done very very well off the back of a 15% depreciation and for those who uh, source their revenues elsewhere in Europe and can continue to access those markets it's not about uh, having tariff-free access, but having
broad access, then they can continue to prosper in this environment, particularly if sterling takes a further leg downwards. One final question has to be about the length of time it's now going to take us. Here we are now, uh, what, just uh, 14 or 15 months away from the March 2019 deadline. Yes. Uh, we've apparently got this financial deal now, well, discussed almost mm -hmm. to the point of agreement. Uh, can we succeed in getting any trade deal sorted out by March 2019? Well, first barrier to that is the third and final criteria, the Northern Irish border, which I've always thought the divorce payment, the 50 billion, is the easy part to do. The difficulty is starting to uh, disentangle the border issue from the future trade deal. The UK's position is that you need to start talking about the trade deal before we can um, uh, get a solution to the Northern Irish question. But clearly the Irish government do not see it that way. There's very little goodwill on offer. In direct answer to your question, will we get a comprehensive trade deal by March 2019? No chance. Is there a possibility that a two-year transition taking through to 2021 makes that more plausible? Yes, I think it is. But the UK will also want to use that time to prepare for a situation where that comprehensive trade deal is not possible and they leave under a hard Brexit scenario. Okay, Simon, we've got to leave it there, but thanks indeed uh, for joining us. Uh, Simon French is uh, Chief Economist at Pamir Gordon, talking there about the latest developments and the future expectations for those looking towards a Brexit deal.